Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, it's time to get this thing going. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening for the Crabber Workshop. I know it's a beautiful evening, so it's probably not ideal to be in front of a computer, but it's an exciting time. So we have crab season approaching, is opening up tomorrow throughout much of Puget Sound and other areas coming up soon. Um, I'm Jason Morgan, Marine Projects Manager for the Northwest Straits Foundation, who is hosting this event. We are a nonprofit. We're working to protect and restore the marine resources of Puget Sound. Um, before we get going with our presenters, I'd just like to take a few seconds to guide you through some of the valuable resources that we have on our website. Um, you can find these resources at catchmorecrab.org. You can see the web link at the bottom of the screen here. Um, so first off, if you get to the page, first off, um, as I mentioned, we are a nonprofit. So if you would like to, to make a donation to support our work, you can do so by clicking the make a gift button at the top of the screen or clicking the donate button on the right. Um, so this web page has a lot of good um, information. It has some instructional videos. And as you scroll, scroll down, you will find more of these videos on the how, how to properly prepare and set your crabbing gear. Um, further down on the page, you will also find useful web links and phone apps for tides, marine traffic, rules, and regulations. Um, for this workshop, we are going to ask that you submit all questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen only. Um, we have uh, 282 um, households registered for this. So because of that, we cannot use a raise hand or chat feature. It's just too much to manage. So please do the Q&A function. Uh, we will read your questions aloud to the presenters. Um, and we may answer some by typing in the answers as well. Um, there will be time after each presentation for questions and answers. So our speakers today, um, both with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife will be Daniel Sun and Caitlin Bosley. Uh, we'll begin with Daniel uh, talking about Puget Sound crab management. Daniel, you can go ahead and uh, uh, share your screen and uh, start your video. Um, so Daniel is a commercial crustacean fishery manager for Puget Sound for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, I have here some of the recent transplant, but this bio is from three years ago. So he's at least a uh, three years ago uh, transplant. And hang on, I just lost my uh, script with that. Sorry. Here we go. Sorry, I got your bio back up, Daniel. Um, so where did I leave off? So from Port Town, so he moved from Port Townsend from the Oregon coast, where he helped manage the coastal crab fishery for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. He has a master's of science in marine resources management from Oregon State University. And the floor is yours, Daniel. Thank you, Jason. Um, can you see my screen and hear me all right? Sure can, thanks. Awesome. All right. Uh, as Jason said, my name is Daniel Sun. Um, with Washington Department of Wildlife, um, I am the commercial crustacean fishery manager. Uh, in the purview of my job, I manage the, the state commercial Dungeness crab fishery, uh, spot prawn, non-spot shrimp pot fisheries, uh, shrimp trawl, and then the sand shrimp intertidal uh, burrowing shrimp fishery. Uh, we can go ahead and get into this. As soon as I activate my mouse. Uh, so today, um, in this presentation, my, my colleague Caitlin and I will be going through um, kind of a broad overview of crab management in Puget Sound, including some management principles for the Dungeness crab um, and red rock crab spe uh, species and fisheries. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the different harvest groups that are in Puget Sound and then the allocation requirements therein, as well as the timing of some of those different harvests, because we, we get a lot of questions about who's fishing when and, and you know who gets to go first, things like that. Um, my colleague Caitlin will, will dive into uh, a fair bit of detail into some recreational rules um, for the Dungeness and Red Rock crab fisheries uh, and talk about some of the resources and conservation background regarding those. Um, and then we'll go through together uh, a demonstration of some crab equipment, uh, best practices, and different ways to um, catch crab. And as, as Jason indicated, we are very happy to answer questions. Anything that, that comes up, you're welcome to, to uh to throw our way. If we can't answer it now, we are more than willing to, to get back and answer back to you at a later time. So moving forward, you know, we're going to be focusing on Dungeness crab um, and red rock. On the, the left is the, the Dungeness crab, uh, Metacarnosinus magister or cancer magister, depending on who you ask. And then on the right, 
is uh, red rock crab or cancer productus. These are both cankered crabs uh, that are native to Puget Sound. Uh, in Puget Sound, uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife manages two separate species for crab. Um, these are the state recreational crab fishery um, and then the state commercial crab fishery. So the recreational crab fishery, as, as many of you are likely aware, requires a crab endorsement in order to participate. Every year, and there's some variance between years, but every year, more than 200,000 crab endorsements are sold. Um, so that, that gives the number of people that could participate in our recreational crab fishery to be um, in some years, close to a quarter million of people. Um, catch reporting for this fishery is required uh, via catch record cards. And that's, that's a little bit different than many of the other fisheries in, in Puget Sound. Catch record cards is really the only uh, source of information that we have to estimate catch, unlike with salmon or shrimp, where we, we do some other things. Um, for the recreational crab uh, fishery, there are two separate seasons, uh, and these seasons are outlined in commission policy. So there's the summer season, which starts as early as July 1st, depending on the, the weekdays on which July 1st fall, uh, falls, uh, and goes through Labor Day. And then the winter season starts October 1st and goes through uh, December 31st. Uh, and both of those time periods, uh, uh, it's been prescribed to be a Sorry, for the summer fishery, it's a five day a week fishery, um, unless there's a conservation concern. And then for the winter fishery, it's a, a seven day a week fishery. Now the state commercial fishery, which I'm a little bit more familiar uh, with, um, is a limited entry fishery. That means that there's a, a, a fixed number of people that could participate in that fishery. Uh, for Puget Sound, there are 249 licenses. We allow up to three licenses to be stacked on a boat. And each license um, entitles those uh, license holders to uh, fish with up to 100 pots per license. Uh, rarely do they fish 100 pots per license. We often put pot limits that are lower than that in order to uh, uh, help the market and, and uh, limit too much catch so that, that we can stay within any uh, allocated share. Um, any landings for a commercial Fisher must be recorded on a fish ticket. It's similar to a CRC, but a, a lot more detailed. They fill out records in a quintuple kit and mail them to the state, tells us their price per pound, how many pounds they were landing, where they were fishing, uh, taxes, number of people on the boat, um, a whole number of, of things. The state commercial fishery runs from October 1st through April 15th. And that means that the the state recreational of the fishery, the crab fisheries that the Department of Fish and Wildlife manages, the state recreational fishery um, goes prior and, and gets first um, crack at, uh, at the crab resource uh, that the, the state is entitled to take. For Puget Sound crab management, there are a couple different like spatial management units that we use. Um, if you fish in Washington, you might be familiar with these, these uh, recreational marine areas on the right. Um, you know, uh, for Puget Sound, those are four, five, six, seven, eight, one, eight, two, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Um, for crab, we have similar but slightly different areas, um, which are shown here on the left. We call these the Puget Sound crab management regions. And each of these different regions on the left um, they're uh, an area with a discrete quota. So uh, a certain amount of crab is allocated for harvest within the boundaries of, of those areas. Uh, and that's kind of the spatial unit that we manage our, our fishery on. Uh, we don't give you separate crab areas and separate salmon areas as recreational harvesters to try and simplify some of the rules that we have in the, the recreational marine areas that we have um, were initially uh, design for the salmon fishery management. And, and uh, since they were already in place, we, we jumped onto those. Uh, in the center here, you see a table that kind of translates uh, what crab region uh, is uh, which recreational um, marine area. So uh, for Puget Sound uh, crab fisheries, both the state commercial and recreational, um, our management is subdivided amongst those eight regions, one, two, east, two, west, three, one, three, two, three, three, four, five, six, and seven. Um, for regions one, two, east, 
two west and three. Those areas have both state commercial and recreational fisheries. Um, the recreational gets first crack at, at, at the quota in those areas uh, in the summer fishery. Um, and then in the winter, both the, the recreational and the commercial fisheries uh, fish side by side if there's enough uh, quota to accommodate both fisheries. If there's not enough quota to accommodate both fisheries, then the recreational um, fishery gets priority on, on any remaining quota in those areas as well. Now regions four, five, and six, uh, those are, are by commission policy are deemed state recreational only areas. So there is no state commercial crab fisheries in regions four, five, six, and seven. These are South Sound, uh, kind of Central Sound, Elliott Bay, and Hood Canal. Uh, for marine areas, those are 10, um, uh, 12, 11, and 13. This is a record of, of uh, total harvest by the state crab uh, fisheries, uh, state crab commercial and recreational fisheries from 1993 through 2001. Um, on the, the X axis, you can see the, the, the season. Our crab seasons run from April through um, essentially April, so they split a year. So a season for say 2020 is uh, happened in the years 2020 and 2021. Um, and then on the Y axis is the, the millions of pounds that were harvested. So um, on this graph, you can see that for a significant period of time, the state commercial fishery um, harvested um, probably two thirds of, of the amount of the, the resource. Um, in 2000, 10, the, the uh, commission uh, revisited the crab policy, um, which guides um, you know, how we prioritize uh, the, the resource across our, our different fisheries. Um, and it, it, uh, it moved from uh, a commercial uh, emphasis to a, a recreational priority. And you can see transitioning from the 2010, 2011, uh, sorry, the 2009-2010 season to the 2010-2011 season, um, that there's a, a pretty big shift uh, between the harvest of, between the commercial and recreational fisheries. And the, the recreational fishery, the amount the recreational fishery was taking um, uh, became a lot more even with the state uh, commercial fishery. Uh, starting in 2017, we had to implement a, a series of conservation closures in South Sound um, and South Hood Canal. Um, and uh, the harvest uh, for those years, or since we have done that, has has team, uh, seemed to, to uh, the recreational harvest since then has been slightly diminished. Uh, here's a kind of a, a simple graphic of. Uh, thank you. Uh, there, here's a simple graphic of of timelines for uh, fisheries that may be going on at any point in Puget Sound for a, a given year. So for an example year of 20, the 2022-23 season, a tribal fishery can be happening at any point in time. They are governed by the same management plans and agreements um, that we are. Um, and they, they have to structure their fisheries around soft shell and they have the same rules regarding size and sex and everything that we do but they have a little bit more flexibility on when they can prosecute those fisheries. Um, so that is why at any point, at any point, in the, at any point during the year, somewhere in the sound, there may be um, a tribal fishery going on. That doesn't mean they're happening everywhere all the time. It just means that they're localized and, and move around. Um, for the state fisheries, um, the summer fishery starts, as I mentioned, July 1st. Um, through Labor Day, uh, and then the winter fishery starts October 1st and goes through December 31st. For some of our regions, like uh, uh, Marine Area 7, there are later openings due to um, avoiding the, the soft shell season for crab there, um, and that changes the, the season uh, slightly as indicated by that darker brown. Uh, box. And then for the state commercial fishery, it starts October 1st and goes through April 15th. Now the summer and uh, the summer recreational fishery, as I mentioned before, is a five day a week fishery running from Thursday through Monday with Tuesday and Wednesday being closed. Um, and you are required to pull your gear at that time. Um, the resource 
uh, the crab resource is allocated across uh, various groups within Puget Sound um, by a, a quota mechanism. So there's a, a total harvestable allowance um, that is split between the, the state and the tribes. Um, the, the, in 1993, the tribes right to harvest uh, shellfish in Puget Sound, right to 50% of the harvest in, in Puget Sound, um, was uh, ratified, uh, re-ratified at that time. Um, and as a result of that, we've uh, ended up uh, engaging in co-management of this research with the tribes where they get 50 and, and we get 50. Of the share that the state gets of the 50% that it's get, um, currently recreational harvest is giving priority it's not given a priority over a certain amount. There's not a target that the recreational harvest can uh, is set to take. It's set, we structure it to take as much as it can within the guidelines of that five day a week season and then the winter season that I, I described. So there's a little bit of variation amount uh, amongst where uh, we, uh, where our two user groups, the commercial and, and recreational fleets end up that are managed by the state. Uh, in theory, they could harvest every crab in Puget Sound. That hasn't happened. Um, more often than not, the state commercial fishery harvests more. Um, and it's the crab policy that guides this. Dungeness crab fisheries um, west coast wise are managed by a management framework called the 3S system. 3S's stand for size, sex, and season. Only crab six and one quarter inches are uh, permitted to be harvested. Only male crab six and one quarter inches are permitted to be harvested. This gives us a number of years for the males to reproduce before being able to be caught by the fishery. Um, and allows, by limiting harvest to only male crab, it allows the females a chance to reproduce without harvest pressure. Um, and then our seasons uh, are, are structured to avoid overlapping with uh, the molt of, of these species to prevent handling mortality and to maximize the quality of the resource. Um, as I mentioned in, okay, for uh, sexing crabs, um, you can sex a male crab by uh, flipping it over and looking at the underside of the abdomen. Um, male crabs have a narrow abdominal flap, um, sometimes compared to a lighthouse or a pinnacle or a tower, whereas female crabs have a much broader abdominal flap, which they use to clutch eggs, as this picture in the bottom shows. Um, that female crab there can have as many as two and a half million eggs in a single clutch. Uh, to check for a soft shell crab, you can uh, squeeze the underside of the carapace. Um, in the top right picture here, you see someone kind of holding the crab's claw up and giving a soft squeeze of the underside of, of the carapace. If it has give or sounds um, Kind of like styrofoam, then that that crab is relatively soft. You can also squeeze the walking legs, um, and if the the walking legs have give or the the membranes in between where the joints articulate, um, balloon that crab is, would also be soft. Soft crab in terms of edibility, there's not a safety concern, but the quality of of that uh, uh, of that crab uh, for eating for Dungeness crab anyway um, is is not good. The meat is stringy and it's not. There's not a lot of it, uh, and the, the texture is is not desirable. And then from a, like a, a resource prioritization standpoint, fishing on soft shell uh, crab doesn't really give them a chance to uh, fill out, and it, it's probably not the best use of that resource. Here's a picture of us in the field doing some more of those crab squeezing. And here's a very soft crab. Do not do this, that crab will die if you do that. <laughs> For red rock crab, they are also managed by a size limit. Um, in Puget Sound, um, you can take either sex, male or female, but they all have to be greater than or equal than five inches. Um, when you're measuring a crab, do not use anything but a crab gauge um, and measure between uh, just inside of the outermost spines. Uh, for sexing red rock, um, it's similar to Dungeness, narrower abdominal flap for males, a broader abdominal flap for females. And uh, the season structure for red rock crab is incidental to the Dungeness crab fisheries. 
um, due to management and enforcement um, constraints, we're unable to offer red rock seasons when there's not a Dungeness crab fishery going on. But you're uh, by creating those fisheries as incidental um, and having the seasons coincide with Dungeness seasons, we're able to offer some additional opportunity. With that, I'll happy to take questions on any of the, the material that I've just discussed. Um, and then my, my colleague will break into the, the season schedule for this year and start going over some of the more explicit rules. Okay, thanks, Daniel. That was great. Um, and I know a, a lot of people signed on after the intro. So for, for those of you who missed it, um, we're taking quest uh, uh, questions and answers just through the Q&A tab on the bottom of the screen. So if you have any questions, uh, type it in there um, and we'll we'll answer those questions for you. Um, so Daniel, the first one was um, when you show somebody holding that soft shell crab, you said, don't do that, the crab will die. So the, um, this person is asking, you know, specifically do what? What are you telling them not to do? Uh, the image I was referencing was this. This is yeah. a soft shell crab. Um, they can be that soft. Uh, they'll feel kind of soft and heavy. Um, when you come across a, a soft shell crab, my re recommendation was to treat them gingerly and not, not uh, you know, try and stretch them. Okay. Uh, when they grow, they 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 step out of their their hard shell um, and inflate themselves like a balloon with water, um, and then the maximum extent that they they inflate the the new parchment like shell that they have. Um, will be the new size that they will grow into, and then they'll fill in that water with muscle tissue. So here you're, you're seeing um, a crab that that died that one of our our, our technicians um, came across, and we were using it as a, a reference picture. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, all right. Does if you were to go if you were to go crabbing for Dungeness crab on a small boat with a couple of family members, where would you go? <laughs> well, kind of uh, I think for most people, it's all location, location, location. Um, I'm I'm closest to Marine Area Nine and Marine Area Six. Our office is located in Fort Townsend, so I would I would be inclined to go there. Um, depending on the gear type and and everything that you want to to use, uh, that might change my my opinion. Um, I think that uh, a small boat with a number of people for kind of a fun time and easiest access to the resource. Uh, what? Any of the bay, I'd say a small or one of the bays, probably. Yeah, any of the, the bays or, or Central Sound, uh, Skagit Bay, Port Susan, anything like that. Um, next question is, are you saying we can, we can or cannot keep soft shell red rock crab? Uh, I think the, the soft shell uh, rules apply to both red rock and dungeon S crab. Um, in terms of what our, you know, what we were able to in, enforce and, and everything, it, it kind of varies, but we do have rules preventing the harvest of any soft shell crab. Okay. Um, how many Dungeness crab do you estimate are in the entire Puget Sound? That's a, that's a, a great question. It's an ongoing area of, of research and it's, you know, um, it's one that we are actively trying to answer. Uh, no, no. Yeah, but we we don't know <laughs> the the exact number of the number of crabs. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, here's a popular one we usually get. In general, why have the crab numbers plummeted in marine areas eleven and thirteen? So that that is also an area of active research too. Um, we we have a number of theories as to why the the number of crab went down. One of the the ones that um, is most commonly cited is that. The area of South Sound there, uh, it has a very long residence time for the water uh, that's there. And it, it could mean that uh, the amount of larval crab that uh, are delivered there from outside sources is relatively low. So there's, there's not a lot of new addition to the population for that area. Sorry, I was muted. Um, we'll do a couple more here. Um, so we see boats in Saratoga Passage now that are lowering crab pots. Um, they're asking, who are they? Um, seems they shouldn't be either commercial or recreational based on your calendar. Um, so the tribes per, uh, in Saratoga Passage, they had two fisheries in this, uh, this last June um, uh, at two different times for three days apiece. Uh, depending on the days, it could have been them. It's also the, there's always the option that someone was fishing illegally. Mm -hmm. 
fisheries potentially. Yeah, and outside of travel commercial fisheries, which are very punctuated, have three or four day windows typically in the summer, um, it could have been a, a tribal a ceremonial or subsistence fishery. Right, okay. Um, we'll do one more, Daniel, and then for the sake of time, we'll move on to Caitlin, but maybe you can hop on and answer some of these other, other ones um, through the keyboard. So one more live we'll do here is if we accidentally bring in a soft one, Will they survive if we put them back in the water at shore about 200 to 300 yards from the catch point? Uh, so any crab that you're not intending to, to keep, you are supposed to release immediately upon retrieving them. If you're fishing through a mechanism like a, a paddleboard where you're not necessarily sorting on, uh, on the water, um, do your best to, to treat it gently and get it back um, as quickly as you can. Um, but in terms of our, our rules, and if you're on a small vessel, uh, we do require you to sort immediately, record on your catch card um, anything that you're intending on keeping. And then if you want to do any high grading or anything, you have to do that, switch them out as you go throughout the day. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, there's some other ones for you. You could, you could an answer on the keyboard. I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Caitlin here. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, Time for Caitlin Bosley. Caitlin is the lead Puget Sound crustacean biologist for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. She oversees management of state recreational and commercial crab and shrimp fisheries in Puget Sound and supervises a team of biologists and technicians that engage in fishery monitoring, surveys, and research. She also serves as a primary technical advisor to the co-management of Puget Sound crab and shrimp resources for the state of Washington. She received her PhD in fishery science from Oregon State University and spent three years working with NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service modeling marine fish populations before making the jump to Puget Sound crustaceans in 2019. She's now living in Port Townsend where she has been perfecting the practice of what she calls crabble boarding, crabbing <laughs> from a paddle board. Sounds fun. <laughs> it is fun. And I'm gonna give it a test this weekend, yay. Um, so, a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me to speak with the group today. Um, I'm, my topic is going to be going over the uh, recreational seasons, talking about some of the rules and uh, some best practices for uh, crabbing in Puget, Puget Sound. So, this year we announced our recreational crab seasons on June 15th. Um, and this table here that I've, I'm showing on my screen shows uh, what we're looking at for seasons throughout uh, Puget Sound and different marine areas. In marine areas four, five, six, eight, one, eight, two, nine, and twelve, we can expect an opening tomorrow, July first. Um, that's Friday this year, and we're going to be open five days a week from Thursday through Monday. We're closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays through that entire time period. Uh, we have limited seasons in some other areas where soft shell. There's conservation concerns, or we have limited quota. Uh, in Seven South this year, we're opening on July 14th. Uh, we typically delay our opening here because of soft shell um, concerns of her crab. They tend to molt and remain soft later into the season. So we're opening July 14th uh, through September 30th. This is also going to be a Thursday through Monday fishery. Uh, Seven North, we have those same um, issues with delayed uh, molting patterns. And so we'll be opening on August uh, 18th, uh, five days a week. Um, for the last few years, there was a comment and question uh, about, uh, you know, uh, concerns about the population of crab in South Sound. So in marine areas 10 and 11, we have a limited quota. Uh, we continue to have conservation concerns about the abundance of crab in that area. We are offering uh, some uh, harvest opportunity this year, just as we have the last few years, um, only two days a week, opening July 3rd. Uh, and, and opening and staying open through September 5th uh, in Marine Area 10 and uh, through August uh, 30th uh, in Marine uh, Area 11, open only two days a week. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to offer opportunities in South Sound Marine Area 13 or in Hood Canal south of AOC Point this year uh, because of conservation concerns. Uh, this uh, image here is just a map of the Puget Sound showing our recreational marine areas. These are the areas that we manage um, crab, and each one of these areas has discrete um, uh, quotas that we manage separately. All right, so I'll just launch into some of the harvest rules. Um, I'm sure several folks on this call might be new to um, crabbing this year, and so I just really want to highlight um, sort of the main 
the main rules and uh, what we would like to see from the recreational community when they're out on the water this season, what they need to be thinking about when they're harvesting crab, um, where to find information, um, what they need to be looking for. So uh, first we'll start with the recreational harvest rules uh, for Dungeness crab, Puget Sound. Uh, as Daniel said, we follow the three S management framework, size, sex, season. So we're retaining only males. And we have a minimum size limit of six and one quarter inches. So do not retain any crab that are smaller than six and a quarter inches. Uh, one of the rules uh, is that the back shells if you uh, need to be retained uh, to prove uh, to an enforcement officer, if you're to uh, run into one, that you um, are har have harvested a, a crab of that legal size limit. Um, sometimes people are, are cleaning their crab out in the field and um, removing the back and the body parts and then just keeping the legs and the meaty part to bring home. If you do that, keep the back shell because if you run into an enforcement officer, they're gonna wanna make sure that you are actually following the rules and harvesting the legal size crabs. The daily limit is five, so five male legal size crabs per day. And um, as we had already mentioned, if you run into crab that are soft shell, they are light in color. They're, they um, kind of squeeze a little bit. They flex when you give them a little uh, squeeze on their uh, legs and on the underside of their carapace. Put them back. They're not ready to be harvested yet. And if you did retain them and cook them and eat them, you would be disappointed because they don't have a lot of meat. So don't retain the soft shell crab. Um, we sometimes get the question about whether or not you should keep can keep claws only. This is more specific to red rock crab, but it's been asked about Dungeness crab as well. Do not just do not keep the claws. You have to retain the entire animal. Uh, if you remove the claws, it damages the animal and it causes them to bleed and there's a potential for mortality. So take the whole animal for red rock crab and also for Dungeness. For um, red rock crab, they're very unlikely to grow um, once they reach the legal size that we keep them here in Washington State. They're very unlikely to grow anymore past that point to be able to even regrain those claws. So there they are a entirely different species from stone crab, which people are familiar with that. Yeah, on the east, on the east coast. Thank you, Daniel. So, um, and then for red rock crab, uh, so we have a five inch minimum size limit. Similar rule, back shells must be retained if you are cleaning your crab in the field. Uh, you can retain males or females. Um, after there's actually very few females of red rock crab that get to be five inches. And so it's not um, a harm to the population if you take females over that size. It's actually pretty rare that you'll be running into females of that size. So five inches and, old, and, and larger, males and females, a daily limit of six. Okay. Uh, so we do have some unique license and catch reporting requirements here in Puget Sound. Uh, if you're buying a shellfish license and you want to harvest crab, uh, you need not only the shellfish license, your shellfish seaweed license, um, but also you need to purchase a crab endorsement. Crab endorsement is like a supplemental license that gives you access to the Puget Sound crab fishery. When you buy the crab endorsement, you will also be getting a catch record card. Um, this is an important um, component of our licensing system and reporting system because we manage the crab in Puget Sound with quotas and we share with the with Puget Sound tribes. We need to uh, account for all the crab that are caught so we know how many we've taken and that we're sharing uh, equally with the tribe. So that's how we do that with catch record cards. So you have a crab endorsement and a catch record card. Part of the rule with um, the re recording and reporting requirements is that you need to record any crab that are caught and retained immediately on your catch record card. So for example, um, you pull up your pot, you have a nice legal sized male, you're gonna be bringing it home and cooking it for dinner. Um, you're putting it in your cooler. And at the same time, immediately you, after it's in your cooler, you are pulling out your catch record card and you're recording it onto your catch record card. And that counts as one of your, towards your daily bag limit. Um, we have two different reporting periods. Uh, so you'll have catch record cards for a summer and for a winter. Uh, you need to report your summer catch at the end of the summer season when we have our reporting period open. Similarly, we have to uh, report your winter catch at the end of the winter season when we have our winter reporting period open by the deadlines, one month after the end of the fishery. Um, so that all those rules. The 
without a catch record card. You just need to follow those harvest rules with the six per day, males or females greater than five inches. So no catch record card required for red rocks. In fact, don't re record them on your CRCs. Sometimes people will do that um, and that's not, that's not needed. And we're just looking at for uh, folks to record their Dungeness crab only. All right, I'll just go over a little bit about the um, catch record card. So buy your license, hopefully everybody's got their license, they've got their endorsement, they've got their catch record card, it's in their pocket. So here's what it will look like. Um, each individual catch record card has a document ID and um, each one has 20 lines. Basically that allows you to have 20, record 20 successful trips. Um, whoops, sorry about that. 20 successful trips. Um, when you go out in, in, uh, on a trip uh, and you retain crab, then you have to record the following information and it's shown here. So you have to record the marine area that you are have harvested your crab. Uh, you need to record the month uh, that it is. If it's a summer, um, it's going to be sometime between July and September, and, and then the date. And then you provide a check for each crab that you catch. So in this example, if you have retained three crab for that day, you have three checks for that day and that marine area. Each trip will be entered as a separate line on your catch record card and you can retain up to five per day. Um, if there is a situation where you are very successful in your crabbing and you're taking lots of trips and you've exceeded, you know, you got to the bottom of your 20 lines, you can purchase another catch record card. That costs an additional fee, but uh, there's no limit to the number of catch record cards a license holder can have. You just need to make sure that you report all of your catch at the end of the season. Okay, so reporting is an important part of this, recording and reporting. So we have our catch record card, we have all our trips and catch um, recorded. Um, we need to, that information to come to me back to the agency so we can generate our catch estimate. Um, so it's required that all of the catch record cards are submitted at the end of the season during the reporting period. Uh, the reporting period is 30 days after the end of the season. So we um, require for the summer period that uh, all the catch record cards and everybody's catch is reported by February 1st. For the winter period, it is, um, what is that, February 1st. Uh, we only allow one submission per a catch record card holder per uh, document number. So when you have your, your document ID, you got your catch record card, you can only submit it once. That would, that way, that's way we don't have duplicate entries. There's a mail-in option. So um, lots of times folks come up for the weekend or they're going crabbing for just a couple weeks. Uh, they've completed their, their catch record card. They're done for the season. Uh, we don't have online reporting available until after the season ends. So there is a mail-in option. On your catch record card, there is a mailing address. You can just drop it in the mail and send it to the, um, to the agency. And that counts as your submission for the season. Uh, if you're going to crab all the way up to the end, you have the option for internet submission. Uh, you log on to the wild system just like you did when you bought your license, and you have the option to um, submit all of your lines of your um, catch record card online. Uh, the first question is, did you retain any crab? Yes or no. Uh, if you didn't have any successful trips or you didn't go crabbing, it's really important that you submit your card with a zero entry. Zeros are important. Uh, if you did go crabbing, then it will give you the option to enter in all of your different trips with all the catches and areas and months and dates. Um, if anybody has any problems reporting, sometimes there's a little glitch in the system, sometimes it's a little difficult to navigate, um, please call one of us. You can call myself, you can call Don, you can call Daniel, you can also call uh, somebody at the agency that can help you uh, submit your catch. This is a very important um, part of um, crabbing in Puget Sound. Uh, each year we have about 50% of catch record card holders actually submit their cards and sometimes it can be less. So we're always trying to work to remind people and teach people how to submit their cards. It's very important. 
Um, okay, so I said it's very important that you report your catch, even if you do not catch any crab. So you might have not gone uh, crabbing at all, or you've gone a couple times and you actually didn't catch any Dungeness crab. Maybe you only caught red rock. Um, it's really important that you submit your catch card. Uh, and this graph here just shows the number um, of respondents, so the number of catch record cards that are submitted that have different amounts of catch on them. So along the bottom here, along the x-axis, that's the number of crab per card. And then the y-axis just shows the percentage of cards that have that much that catch. And you can see there's a lot of people that catch low, no or low number of crab each season. And then there's a very few number of people that catch a lot of crab. So those zeros are important. Okay, so getting into the some of the gear roles. So as Daniel mentioned, uh, red rock crab uh, and Dungeness crab can be harvested during the same time period. So when Dungeness crab is open, you can harvest red rock crab. Uh, they open together and they also have the same gear requirements. So you're using the same sorts of equipment to catch both species. Um, and so I'm gonna go over some of the, um, the rules and regulations regarding gear. Um, so the first and probably most important thing I'd like to mention is that each pot um, is required to have a biodegradable device. We call this an escape cord or a rock cord. Each pot is fitted with some sort of material like a string that um, biodegrades, will rot, and if the, crack, if the pot is to be lost, which does happen, that that will eventually rot away, it will biodegrade, and there'll be um, a door or something, the trap will fail, and it will allow crab to escape if the crab is lost, if the trap is lost. This is very important. Every, by law, every, every uh, except for ring pot, ring nets, which are, is shown on the top, every pot needs to have an escape cord. Um, pots uh, need to have a minimum mesh of 100, uh, sorry, one and a half inches. Um, and then each pot needs to have two four and a quarter inch escape rings in the upper half of the pot. And so we have some pots here that we're going to demonstrate, show a demonstration and um, uh, illustrate sort of what we're talking about when we're talking about escape rings. Um, let's see, every buoy that's attached to a crab pot in Puget Sound must be one half red and one half white. So you can see that um, a half red, half white buoy in the illustration, in the, um, in the uh, pictures there. Um, every buoy on a crab pot in Puget Sound needs to be red and white. And it needs to be labeled with the crabbers, whoever's tending the gear, whoever's pot it is, uh, with their full name and address if it's unattended, which means that it was left out on the water, um, or if, even if it's left at a dock and you walk away to go get lunch, you need to have your full name and address um, written clearly and legibly on the buoy. And I'll show some examples of that as well. Um, buoy lines may not float on the surface. So you can see in that picture, we have a very specific kind of um, a line. It's a sinking or lead line. Uh, it doesn't float at the surface. It doesn't allow, um, it, 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 it uh, doesn't um, sit on the surface so it can get entangled in kelp or wrapped up in boats and, and it's just unsafe and potential to lose gear, lose your gear if you um, don't have a sinking line. So that's important. And then finally, only two units of gear are allowed per person. Um, on each, uh, each day. So I personally can be fishing two, two different types of gear, two pots, it could be two pots, it could be a ring net, it could be a snare. Um, so two units of gear per person per day. All right, so here I'm just gonna walk through kind of what a legal, a legal, not illegal, a legal um, crab um, pot setup looks like. Okay, so number one here is our, our, our properly marked red and white buoy. You can see it has to be legibly, legibly written with your name and your um, address, red and white. Um, the next part here is number two is a sinking line. This illustration shows an actual weight on the line. Um, that is an option. It's kind of difficult to rig up, so I recommend the, that sinking line. Um, and also uh, to help with your gear loss um, or uh, to reduce the amount of drag that you have on your pot, um, it's recommended that you have 25 to 30% extra line on your, it's called scope, extra line on your buoy line, um, then the depth of the water that you're fishing. 
Uh, number three here are the two escape rings on the top half of the pot. So we have two of those at four and a half inch diameters. This allows the um, sublegal males and small females to escape the pot and not be retained in the pot. Um, number four here is the um, escape cord. It's comprised of 100% natural fiber. It can be jute, it can be uh, hemp. Um, cotton is a, co is a popular, um, although not ideal item because um, it doesn't biodegrade quite as fast. Um, and then once that uh, escape cord rots away in the event that a pot gets lost, there needs to be a minimum size uh, opening uh, for the crabs to be able to escape and it's three by five inches. Uh, the, the mesh size needs to be one and a, a half inches. Um, and whoops, sorry about that. And there's a total trap volume of uh, 13 cubic feet or less. That's not in the graphic. But this image and all this information is available in the annual uh, sport fishing pamphlet. So if you have any questions, you're not sure what, how to set it up, you're not sure what all of these things are, grab the sport pamphlet. All of it is clearly labeled in there. A couple things that we advise for um, for new crabbers uh, to to sort of add to their setup here would be to weight your pot. Um, this picture here shows a couple bricks. That's number seven. That kind of holds the pot down. It keeps it from floating away in the high currents. I have a lot of places in Puget Sound that have very strong currents, and so we try to minimize the amount of gear that gets lost and swept away. So definitely recommending to um, weight, weight your pots. There's a lot of different ways that that can be done. Um, rugged bait containers, you wanna keep your bait in your pot, uh, in the container. Uh, you don't want it floating away or just dissipating so fast that you don't have a good chance of getting your crab. Um, and then you'll see on the water, a lot of folks will personalize their buoys uh, with PVC or flags or something. Everybody needs red and white. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate yours from others. So you can personalize them in different ways by adding different components. And one of the most popular ways is to add that PVC pipe through the middle of your buoy and add a flag. Um, it makes it easier to find. All right, when you're headed out on the water tomorrow, a um, couple things you don't wanna forget. You don't wanna forget your sport fishing rules pamphlet that is available online on our website. It's also available at all um, retailers where you can buy gear or where you can buy your license. Um, and that should be available now. Uh, you want to remember to have your license, your endorsement, your catch record card on your body. I always have one of those little waterproof um, bags with a pen in there and all of my documentation so I can pull out my pen and record my catch immediately um, when, you, when I keep a, a crab and before I reset my gear. Um, and then also you want to make sure that you have your crab calipers. So these are available at most retailers. We have them. If you need them from us, we can provide them. Um, this is a crab gauge. This is what you use to determine whether or not your crab is a legal size. You should have this on your person in your boat with your gear um, to make sure that you're retaining legal size crabs um, for red rock and indigenous crab. You want to have bait wide variety of different types of bait and everybody's got their special recipe. Um, some of the um, most popular uh, bait types and those the kind that are used by the professional commercial crabbers may include oily fish like mackerel, sardines, salmon. Uh, we like to use clams for our test fishery. That's a pretty effective uh, bait and squid. And in some, in some cases, chicken, turkey, herring, um, are great options as well. So just try a few different things and see what works for you. Um, I always like to have a container, make sure you've got a bucket. I like to have a knife with me too. Um, what I, one piece of um, advice I'd like to recommend to folks is that when you're, when you take your crab out, um, you wanna keep it kind of cool, uh, on ice or you know out of the sun, keep it moist with burlap, uh, wet burlap or towels. Uh, it's not the best option to keep it in a bucket with water, unaerated, heats up, it, you, they use up all the oxygen and they don't survive very well. So it's better just keep them out of the water, keep them out of, the, out of that, um, that uh, you know, unaerated water and then your crabs will be in much better condition and they'll be, you know, be able to get them home alive. Uh, a few other tips for helping improve your catch. Um, add some weight to your entry gates that may open in a strong current. Uh, some of the pots that folks have uh, tend to be rather lightweight. 
Um, and the little doors will swing open when there's a strong current. And that allows, I've experienced this many times, that allows your crab that are in your pot to actually go out. And so it's recommended that you can put little um, lead weights on the little doors to keep the doors down in the current. And that will help you help the crab, crab be retained into your pot. Um, we'll go over some of the different types of crab pots, but there's traps that have ramps. There's ones that are flat that um, the crab just crawl right along the bottom, go into your pot, but then there's ones they have to climb up the ramps. And, it, and once they go into your pot, they can't, those ramps kind of keep them from going out. So that's a, a nice thing that keeps, that improves your catch and keeps, makes it harder for the crab to, to leave your pot. Um, you also want to, each year, I just did this today, I'm sure everybody's going to be doing it if they haven't done it already, to pull out your gear, inspect it, look and see what, what the condition is, are there holes, is everything working, are the doors swinging, do you have rock cord, um, you just want to make sure that it's really going to, um, it has all the components that you need to have legal gear, and that all the pieces are working to, you know, maximize your catch, do that before you put it in the water. Um, make sure you have durable bait containers. There's a whole lot of different kinds and we'll go over a demonstration of the different types of bait uh, that are uh, containers that are available. I did mention, just check your escape cord, um, change it if you need it. If you've gone several seasons with your escape cord, it seems like it's starting to get um, you know, uh, degraded a bit. Uh, there's the options to, um, to uh, replace that. And let's see, attach the bait. Okay, so another uh, good example of um, improving your catch would be to make sure you maximize the space in your pot. So you want to put the bait in a, in a location in your pot that allow, doesn't obstruct the doors um, and allows the crabs to go in and have the doors closed behind them um, so they can't, they don't get like, out, they don't have the opportunity to go out. So put the bait in the center on the top or on the bottom of your trap. Um, crab move around. They're, they go all over the place. And so be prepared to try different things, try different depths, try different baits. Um, and you might find that some situations are more successful um, than others in different places. So, um, and then, yep. Yeah, and so try different baits. I think that's about it. All right. So our program, um, some of the catch record card money that you pay for when you buy your endorsement uh, goes towards recovery of derelict gear. And I know Jason well, taught, has a lot of resources uh, for crabbers to learn about, you know, reducing your catch, uh, reducing your the chances of losing your gear and your gear becoming derelict. Uh, there's a lot of it. It happens a lot. And so there's some, there's some Im images here of just the, the you know sheer volume of gear that we're pulling out of Puget Sound every year from uh, gear that's got, it's lost from not properly configuring your pots, not properly weighting your pots, not looking at the rules and regulations and thinking through the different scenarios with high currents um, that we have here in Puget Sound. So um, yeah, so we go out and we sweep out this gear that's been lost and trying to get the trash out of the water. So there's a lot of it. Uh, and so this graph here kind of shows a little bit of the details on um, those pots that we're removing from the water uh, year to year. We started this project in 2017 and we're continuing it uh, today and we'll be doing it again this year. Uh, this graph shows the number of pots on the y-axis that we're removing each year and then the different colors show the different types of pots. The red and green are recreational pots, pretty much almost exclusively, other than with some tribal and some state commercial, um, all the pots that are lost in Puget Sound are recreational pots. Uh, there's different types of pots that are more likely to get lost um, because of their weight. Um, the square light Di Danielson type pots tend to not tend to be very light and susceptible to getting washed away in the current, or if their buoy has a lot of drag, it will get lost or pulled into deep water. And so the blue here shows the number of pots that we lose each year that are those square light Danielson st style. So if you are fishing that style of pot, just be extra aware that you're at a greater risk of losing your gear. So think about weighting it and think about um, configuring your buoy to try to minimize that loss. Um, so here's another graph here that shows uh, sort of the difference in, in um, in the what's lost between a weighted and unweighted pots on the left. So we have 64% of the pots that we uh, recover during our derelict gear sweeps on closed days are not weighted. 
Um, so the large majority of them are not weighted. So if you don't want to lose your pot, put some weight in there. That's that's kind of a, a standard mantra of ours. Um, also, one of the biggest problems that we see uh, on these gear on the gear that's recovered is that the buoys are not attached correctly. So we'll go over a demonstration of how to properly attach buoys, but you'll notice that in the, in the figures that they're rounded on one side and flat on the other. The rounded side goes down and that helps reduce drag things from getting caught on the buoy and the buoy line and dragging it off with the current and deep water. So um, big problem, new crabbers tend to not correct. Uh, correctly attach their buoy and increase their risk of losing gear. Um, let's see, a few uh, different items that we can think about to minimize. Oh, so this is maximizing es escapement from lost traps. So if you, your pot does get lost, we don't want it to keep fishing um, and killing crab um, while it's underwater. Uh, there's a, you know, a lot of work that we do to try to remove that stuff out of the water, but there's things that you can do to help make it um, safer for the crabs and to uh, make it um, make these uh, be more escapement from the lost traps so we're not killing so many crabs. Make sure we're using escape cord. Um, use the types of escape cord that rot quickly. Um, you can reduce the diameter of the, uh, uh, the rot cords. This uh, 120 is kind of the standard legal so uh, diameter for these um, uh, uh, escape cords, but you can uh, improve the degradation rate by reducing that. So like splitting it in half and using half the, half the thickness of the escape cord. Um, and there's different ways that you can, can configure your escape cord to uh, maximize the escapement if the pot is to be lost. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the different types of configurations and the different types of pots uh, if they become derelict what we can look for and ways to minimize, um, to maximize escapement um, and minimize uh, crab loss. Here's an example of one way to, um, to set up a pot with escape cord um, to cover that hole um, and attach an escape ring that will, that will allow a lot of crab to escape from the pot if it is to become derelict. You can see that there's that ring and it's attached with the escape cords and it's covering sort of this large opening when those escape cords are um, rot away and biodegrade, that leaves a very large opening for crab that uh, the, the pot fails and the crab can easily go in and out and we're not killing crab while this, this pot is, is underwater. And here's an example of a picture of when we remove that escape ring that was attached by the escape cord, the crabs are just coming right out of the pot. Um, they're not retained and trapped inside there. Okay, this is an image of that Danielson style pot where the door is on the top, um, the escape uh, rings are on the top, um, it's held by a buoy, let's see, yeah, should we show it? Um, I'm sorry, it's held by a hook, and then the escape cord is um, basically attached to the, the closing, the hook, the closing mechanism. And so when that escape cord uh, fall, uh, fails, then there's a, a bungee on the top of the door that will allow it to swing open and then the crab to escape. Okay, I think that answer that covers all that I wanted to cover about gear and regulations. So we can take some questions and then we'll um, show a demonstration of how to rig up our gear and show some different types of, um, of equipment that you can use to catch crab. Okay. Um... Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. So Daniel's been doing a good job of answering a lot of questions on here. Um, and being that it's seven o'clock, I think maybe we'll just take one of these because some of these I can continue to answer while you all do your demonstration. Um, but this would be one you could visually do. They ask, um, can you show us how to properly measure a crab? I'm pretty sure y'all have oh, a slide back there sure. somewhere. Yeah. Yep. So what I'm going to do now, I think, is I'm going to switch over to my other video so you can okay. see Okay, so they'll be able to see right here, Daniel. So here I have the, the back half of a Dungeness crab shell. Can we make um, that video bigger? It's really small on the screen. Oh, here, here. Um, let's see. Stop. I think I have to do a stop share. There you go. That's perfect. Okay, now you can see us? Okay, yep. great. So I have the back half of a, a Dungeness crab shell. Um, here you can see the spines. This crab is widest. Um, at 
this external spine. When we measure, measure a Dungeness crab here, we measure just inside of that external spine. You can see the gauge coming down and hitting this tooth. <laughs> I'm not competing with yeah. cameras and strange locations. Yeah. So this this crab is clearly legal. Um, I have the the gauge within this spine and going across to the other side, and I have more than an inch to spare. That is a big crab right there. And for many of the gauges that you'll see in, in Washington State, they have multiple sizes indicated on them. Um, this one has Red Rock. It has Oregon Recreational Dungeness Crab, Coastal Washington Dungeness Crab, which has a six inch size, and then Puget Sound, the biggest one on this gauge um, is six and three quarter. So if you, you see one of these slots, just double check that you're, you're using the right slot to measure the, the right organism. So if you were to catch a, a red rock, you'd be measuring to the smallest little nodule right by my, my finger there. Okay. Other questions or should we just launch um, right into the... Yeah, I think you can go right into that. I, I, I can okay. answer some of these questions and then we can, okay. uh, done with that, we can answer what's still up there. Okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna try to uh, yell a little bit, but um, so here, We've got our standard sort of recreational lighter weight Danielson style pot. Um, it's uh, we've got in this example here, we've got our escape rings four and a half inch diameter right here. Uh, this one here is actually tied on with the escape cord on in four different places. So this is like that last example that I showed where if this is pot is to get lost, these cords will eventually rot away. This ring will fall um, away, and then any of the crabs that are inside the pot will be able to crawl up and out um, and escape from the pot. Um, in this pot, it's very lightweight. If we didn't have any weight, it's a high chance of getting uh, washed away. I personally use bricks. So I've got two bricks that are zip tied in the corners far away from the um, doors. So the doors are free swinging. There's nothing obstructing it. The bricks are heavyweight. Uh, they're in place. Um, they keep the pot at where I set it. Uh, there are a lot of other different options that you can use for weights. Rebar is a popular example um, for, because they're, it's small, it's heavyweight. You can zip tie it to the bottom of your pot. Uh, it doesn't take up much room in your pot. Um, Don was uh, showing us that um, in the gear that we were recovering in our daily gear efforts, we'll find all sorts of interesting things like hand weights. Um, if you bought hand weights during the pandemic and you're, you know, you used to use them to work out, but now they're just collecting dust, they actually make really good weights. Um, bar barbells, um, um, those disc um, weights that go on the end of a barbell, those are great weights as well. Um, you can use lead heavy weight, uh, heavy lead weights, but what you want to do is just attach weight into the bottom of your pot, especially if you're using a lightweight Danielson style. Um, when you do that, just as, as Caitlin, you know, uh, indicated, you want to make sure that it's not going to impede the function of your trap with these gates. Um, and also that it's not going to impede the function of any of the escape mechanisms, particularly where your bios are. Um, or where your escape ring is located. So we have found pots where the, the escape ring partially obscured by weight, and that would be a violation. And it also makes it much more difficult for uh, uh, the animals that are smaller that you don't necessarily want in there to escape. Here's another uh, Danielson style pot that has a different door mechanism uh, right here. Like in the picture that I showed, we've got a, a hook. This is what we use to close the door. Um, it also has a bungee that opens the door. This hook is attached with the escape cord. So when the escape cord rots away, the door, in theory, is supposed to flop right open. Um, so that, that releasing any crab that are in there. So if we close this, this is how we close it. Uh, most of these pots are, are um, have a, a bridle. Uh, you can attach it on four sides on the top of the pot. It allows it to stay level when you're um, lowering it and um, lifting it up from the bottom. 
And then here we've got a carabiner, and this is what we'll use to attach our buoy line. So you want to do the buoy line? So we got a weighted pod. We've got a skate ring on the top. We've got a skate rock core and a skate mechanism where we've attached a bridle here to hold on to the top of the um, pot to keep it level when we're lowering it. And then we have our weighted line, our lead line that we attach here. So we've got a section of line here. We know what depth we're setting. We we'll make sure we got 30%, 25 to 30%. Um, additional line length over the depth of the water at the uh, lowest tide. And then we attach here with a loop. We've just attached our lead line to the bridle. And then on the other side, we have our buoy, our red and white buoy, uh, which is configured. So the pot is down here. Um, the bullet, the rounded side of the bullet is facing the pot. Uh, we have a knot here on the lower side, on the pot side of the buoy that keeps the line from going in through it. And then on the top, we have a, a loop. Um, it's really nice for if you want to grab it, if you're reaching down off the boat and you just want to grab it and grab it here. Um, so we've got a red and white buoy. Now, um, it's very faded now, but what we need to have to make this a legal um, uh, setup is to have me, the crabber, uh, name and address clearly legibly written onto the on this buoy it needs to be red and white so and there was a question in the chat regarding if you can have other colors on on any of the peripheral gear around your buoy and uh, the, the answer is yes and no so you can have a flag attached to this buoy and the peripherals on that flag can be any color um, but any additional buoys that are attached to this um, need to be red and white, 50% uh, in proportion. We've, you can use other, you know, it could go diagonally or striped or, or whatever, but it needs to be 50% red, 50% white, at least according to the letter of the rules as they're written. Um, using additional like trailer buoys, it can be a, a useful way to help identify your gear and potentially to keep it up when there's current situations. But remember, anytime you add additional stuff that's going to be floating on there and more line paying out to it, you're creating more drag and you may be more likely to use your pot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's go over um, the ring net. So that's that's the pot. Um, this here, there's different types of things that you can use besides the pot to catch a crab. Um, one of the common things you'll find at um, at uh, supply stores is a ring net, and basically it's just two large, very heavy weight rings uh, with a mesh in between, and then it has a bridle. This one's got a little buoy on it and a carabiner. And basically, what you do is you drop this um, down onto the um, onto the sea floor there, and it just lays flat. You have a bait container. Here's our bait container, Scotty jar right here. And then the crabs come in here. And then when you're ready to retrieve the um, the uh, net, you just lift it. And then it creates this like uh, net that the crabs go in and you can pull it up and, and get your crabs. Um, the difference between in some of the gear regulations for this style of pot, so a type of gear and a, and a pot is that we don't require a uh, escape mechanism so we don't need rock cord because when it's not you know being uh, actively fished it's just laying on the um on the water on the floor of the uh, sea floor and uh, it does not need to have the one and a half inch mesh um so we just have a larger mesh here or you can have a smaller mesh it doesn't have the same requirement so uh, there is a difference in fishing style between the, these ring nets and the, the traps. The the ring nets they, they tend to require much more active fishing. So checking them every fifteen to twenty minutes or half hour at, at like a maximum. Because when they're fishing, you can see that the crab can go anywhere on here, and it's not until you tend them that you have a chance of scurrying them uh, of uh, you know retaining any of the crab. So this is an active fishing style where any of these, these pots that we're, we're talking about, they can be put out, they can be soaked overnight 
Um, depending on where you're at, you, you might want to refine your soak times. If you're in an area with good abundance or in a, a more shallow area, uh, you can tend those pots more often doing a you know two, three, four hour soak. Um, if you want to have a more passive fishing experience or you're fishing deeper, um, you might have more luck doing longer soaks or soaking overnight. And you can soak overnight as long as all of the days that you're soaking on um, are going to be open days. So during the summer season, when you have a five day a week season, you can soak for five days in a, in a row as long as you're pulling by uh, Monday. Yep. Because Tuesday and Wednesday are the, the closed days. An additional uh, intricacy of our, our rules in Washington here with the ring net is that you also need a buoy attached to your ring net when you're fishing right. from the pier with right. your address, um, phone number, name, all, all the same materials. All right, I'll just go over bait, bait uh, bags uh, and containers. So there's a lot of different types of bait containers. Uh, we recommend something very um, sturdy. Uh, so here I've got two examples of these are like um, metal kind of mesh bait containers. They can be attached to the top or the bottom, the inside of your pot with a clip. Those are available at local um, retailers. This one has like a little um, flat door here. You can put fish carcass or clams or whatever and then put it in there. Um, you just want to make sure when you're attaching it in your pot that it's staying clear of the doors so you can get, maximize your catch and not obstruct the doors. Um, because then that's the kind of the most rigid. And then this is another popular kind of rigid style. It's called a Scotty jar. This is, this is popular in the commercial fishery as well. Um, actually really nice at, at um, containing the bait um, and having it last a really long time. Um, so one or one or two of those really nice for your crab pot. Uh, red rock crab do a real a number on any sort of bait container that you have in your pot. So, you know, I'm just going to get a little bit closer. Uh, so here is an example, if I can show you, um, of a bait container that was destroyed by red rock crab. So it's important to have something that's very um, rigid and durable, but similar that this is, you know, really nice at retaining the, the bait. Uh, it doesn't dissipate too, too quickly. Um, and this uh, is attached by a little clip on the top of the inside of your pot. You can just um, stuff it and then set it in there. Um, and that's kind of more of a function of the feeding ecology of Red Rock and Dungeness. So Dungeness, they, they're more like siphon snippers. They'll, they'll eat uh, clam siphons and, and more soft tissue stuff. Whereas red rock, they will feed on mussels and, and you know fully shelled organisms. So their their claws are much more muscular and a lot more crushing power. Yes, you don't want to get pinched by a red rock crab. Um, a couple other different soft style of uh, bait bags. These are nice because you can put like um, bait of weird shapes, like a whole fish head or something in here. Um, it's just a soft and flexible plastic mesh bag, again, with a clip. Uh, you can just slide it right in your pot, attach it to the top of the bottom. This is another style like that. It's like a nylon mesh bag that has a halibut clip on it. Um, really nice, easy. You can just clip it on the inside. Uh, but this, I find, kind of flops around a lot. So you want to try to really attach it so it's not flopping around on the inside of your pot too much and obstructing the doors. Um, for bait, remember, you know, Caitlin went through a number of different baits that you can use. Uh, she recommended something that was uh, oily and then something that is kind of more uh, short duration fishing like squid. So uh, clam or mackerel or sardine or, or mackerel, tuna, any of those things, they'll fish for a little bit longer. Um, and then uh, some species of, of squid or turkey or, or things like that, they'll fish for a shorter duration, but then to draw them in a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. Um, remember any bait that you're you're using, you're going to be eating the crab after. So I wouldn't recommend leaving your bait out for overnight or days on end and, and letting it rot. There's you know a lot of theories around doing that and how it improves your catch. I think really the trick of it is you want something oily to create a good bait trail. And when you leave it out overnight to rot, it probably releases some more of the fats that are available in those. Uh, those baits that you're using, that doesn't necessarily mean it's desirable for you when you're going to pop them in a cook pot. You want to talk a little bit more about this commercial style round? Yeah, pot? sure. So this is this is a, a recreational pot. It's just 
in the style of many of the ones that our commercial fishers do, it's, it's round. Um, it has these ramps that go into the pot. They, they're, uh, they can really help increase your catch efficiency because once the crab go in, they have a much harder time exiting through these deep gates um, because they drop in um, behind this ramp. Um, this one's a little bit heavier. I would say it's probably 12 or 15 pounds, um, depending on you know some of the fishy, fishing areas here, you might not need a lot of extra weight if you're fishing shallow or in an area with a, with a lot of tides. I would shoot for your, your pot weighing at least 15 to 20 pounds with the, the additional weight that you, you've added in it. And then if you're gonna fish deeper or add additional trailers or in, your, in an area of high traffic or has um, you know, lots of drifting vegetation, then you will want more weight. Anything that can float over your pot is likely to wrap in your line and pull it away. Uh, let's see. I'll uh, show the skate cord. So the, the yeah. door. This door is the half. The half of the entire top of the pot is the door. Um, similar to the one we said before, the skate mechanism, a uh, rock cord is attached to the, the the clip that holds the door closed. So if that fails, then the door is able to just pop right open. Uh, we've got our skate rings on the upper half of the pot here, uh, one and a half inch net. Yeah. And then with any of these these pots where you're relying on the door being the escape mechanism when your bio fail, um, you can add additional measures to make sure that it works. And that's some of the, the great research that Jason and, and Kyle at Northwest Straits have done. Um, so having an additional bit of elastic here that kind of pulls on this pot and attaches to this back half. So when that this fails, this... Uh, this door is kind of plopped open and is more likely to stay open is a great way of making sure if you do lose your pot that you're, the crab are able to escape much more efficiently. And I think that's it. I was just gonna end uh, with telling folks that, you know, you may go to the store and you're buying a all the gear that you need, or you might be going to buy a setup that's already configured and you think it's set up right, it's got a big bag, it's got you know the um, rock cord. Uh, you just wanna make sure before you go out and put it out in the water and start crabbing that you've checked the rules, that it's configured properly, legally, you've got all the pieces that I just described, you've got your catch record card, you're, you've got all, all everything you need, to do uh, crabbing legally in Puget Sound that you're ready to go because if you just buy a pot off the shelf and head out there, you're probably not ready. So get your pamphlet, um, check the rules, check your gear, make sure you're good to go. Um, and we're always available and happy to answer questions. Awesome. Thank you, you two. Um, so just got a few, few more questions here real quick. Um, one uh, one user said they started a Facebook group for peer crabbing and wants to know if they can use some of the images shown in this meeting. Anything we produce is in the public domain. Yeah. It's it's all you know. We're a state agency, so you're you're welcome to use them. Um, please credit the agency as when you do. Great, thank you. If you um, like our slides, we're welcome to to provide them. Just reach out to us. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just follow up and say, if anybody wants uh, additional materials or images, that they can just reach out to us directly, and we can provide some um, pictures and uh, materials. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, how long do you, how long do you recommend leaving in the? Uh, you're talking about like the round ring style um, in the water before pulling it up. Um, well, you know, I usually use this style, the ring net, uh, if I'm just out for the day, um, like, uh, like if I'm just motoring out with my family, I drop the ring nets and I'm kind of tending it, um, you know, a couple hours, probably at the most, I'd say you, uh, after that, your bait's gone, sea lions will come and take your bait because it's not protected in, um, in a pot. And so I, it's really more for short term uh, fishing, a couple hours probably the most is what I recommend. Whereas these things you can keep out for days. Yeah, and for, for the, the ring net, you'll probably want something pretty robust for your bait so that it will tend to keep things there mm -hmm. rather than get eaten and then they all go away. So yeah. if, if you don't have a very robust bait bag or you're using a frame of a fish, or something like that. Use this. Um, I would uh, recommend tending it more often. Yeah. Um, and it will depend where you're fishing and what you're using. So I would uh, recommend you know doing shorter tendings and seeing how quickly your bait's going just to get started. 
Okay, we've had a had a few questions about what you what you do with all the um, crab pots that you find on those pot sweeps. Oh yeah, so what we we do um, a couple different things. So we catalog all of the gear and uh, inspect them for violations. Uh, we record data on whether or not it has a label buoy or if the bu the buoy uh, was um, attached correctly. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of them become trash because it, it's garbage and there's nothing that we can do. If the buoy is not labeled properly and uh, it's an illegal um, piece of equipment, it goes in the garbage. Sometimes we, if we can identify um, an owner, uh, we'll try to contact them so they can get their uh, pot and their gear back or refer them to the enforcement if there's really egregious violations. Uh, ones that we don't have uh, the proper legal um, identification on the buoy and the gear is in pretty good condition, we will repurpose it and donate it to nonprofit and, and other groups. Uh, we've been really uh, very successful in supporting search and rescue, Boy Scouts, and different um, groups with uh, providing some of this uh, Deer Lake gear for donation so it doesn't just end up in the trash. And the Deer Lake gear program that we, we have, it's pretty unique across the entire country. Um, the funds from your, your catch record card dollars, um, a significant portion of them go to support this work. And it, it is a pretty, it's a, it's a huge lift for uh, gear to be sweeped as often as it is and for gear to be returned back to people. Um, and I, I think people often forget that there's probably no other place in our country where this happens if in the, the world for a recreational user. Well, yeah, not, um, you know, uh, you know, we do a lot of derelict fishing gear, removal of crab pots with our dive crews and we do the same thing. We kind of do the same thing. We donate them. We return them to users if we can. Um, I would, would add, um, you mentioned a lot of them go to trash. Um, I know when we've done removals over there on the peninsula, there's, I forgot the name of it, but there's a metal recycling place over there that'll take the crab pots and recycle them over there. Well, so. yeah, yeah. So we do recycle a lot of it. Um, and in fact, last year we ended up recycling so much that it paid for the dumpster that we had for putting all the recycling into. Oh, no way. <laughs> uh, and ice cream for everybody. Okay, a couple more. Um, what kind of paint is used to color the buoys? Ooh, I don't know if I know the answer to that one. I don't know. Yeah, that's going to have to be a Don Velasquez question because I know that for, we repurpose some of these buoys. We get lots of these um, during the summer, and one of our technicians uh, will paint them again to make them really beautiful for um, auctions and donations. And so I'm not sure exactly what paint he uses, but I can get back to you with the answer of that. So. Yep. Um, an enforcement question. Somebody's asking, what resources do recreational crabbers have to come to combat other boaters who are pulling their pots? Ooh, yeah. So um, I guess I would probably recommend just calling the dispatch, right? Yeah. If you see somebody handling your gear, which is illegal, absolutely not supposed to happen, um, I would just call the state patrol um, and tell them what is going on, and then they will refer to a local um, Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Officer. Yeah, the, the same hotline that you can use to report a, a poacher, um, I would report that. We oftentimes have people on the water, but you know it is a large area, so um, I wouldn't expect a, a response in every circumstance. Uh, if you, you know, our recommendation is to not engage people that are, are doing that, you know, and, and because they, they may be hostile or there may be conflict that arises, but documenting it to the best of your ability without risking yourself mm -hmm. um, could be an additional thing you could do. Okay. And um, the last one's an easy one. How many pots are you allowed to have? Uh, two, per, two units of gear per person. Per licensed person. Yep. And there's not a limit on the number per boat, say, um, which is unlike shrimp. For shrimp, we allow only four units of gear per vessel. Um, so if you have eight people, then in theory, each person can have two pots. Um, that's a lot of gear to carry around, but it's two units of gear per person. So that could be one pot and one ring net or two pots or a ring net and a snare. Um, yeah. yeah, and that that includes you know per person. That means that the buoys need to be modified to reflect the the names of you know the 
point person on the, the boat. So if, if your grandson is with you and, and you're going out with your grandson, two need to have your grandson's names and two need to have your right. names. A yeah. way to, to get at that um, and achieve that kind of on the fly without buying a new buoy setup is to, to wrap a piece of, of tape around the top of your buoy when it's dry um, and, and pretty securely just modify uh, either add a add the the name or modify the name and uh, whatever matches what was registered when you bought the license. Yep. Just a, a quick follow up to that is in saying that you have two gear per person. Somebody asks, does that include fishing gear? They're asking, does that mean oh. they can have one pot and one pole? Two units of crab fishing gear yeah, per yeah. person. Yeah. yeah. There you go. We don't do fins. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, that's um. Well, that was great. You two. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all the questions. You've also we've also got some good comments as well. Just saying thank you and how good the presentation was. I mean, we're here at seven thirty on a beautiful evening, and we still got quite a few participants on there. So I, I think the uh, I think you did a great job. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, have fun out there tomorrow yeah. morning. It's yeah. coming. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much and thank you all for who are attending and I hope you have a great crabbing season. Thanks.